Everybody and welcome to this Astranti video where as you can see we're going to be looking at costs and cost behavior. So cost, what do we think that is? Now I know you're probably thinking surely the cost of an item, let's say a pie for example, is just the amount of money I pay when I buy it. Well actually there's much more to it than that and so I'm sure you're now asking yourself the question well, what is costing them? Well, let's think again about when we buy the pie that I just talked about. And specifically, let's think about the local pie shop where we might buy it from. Now, we all know that the best bit of a pie is the pastry. And the key to a good pastry is nice, fresh eggs. So the local pie shop buys the eggs, which go into making the pastry, which is then used to make the pies. Now, along with the eggs, the pie shop needs a number of other ingredients like milk, flour, and so on. And these are collectively known as the direct materials. Okay, so I hope that's fairly obvious. The cost of a pie will include the cost of the ingredients used in making it. But is that it? Are all the costs sorted? Or are there other costs that the pie shop needs to take into account? Well, we know that a pie doesn't just make itself. The shop is going to have to pay the bakers who produce them, the staff who work in the shop and sell the pies. They're also going to need to pay for the machines and the electricity to run them and a number of other things like rent, for example. And so they need to factor in these expenses when they consider the cost of producing their pies. And this example effectively demonstrates how the cost of an item is not just the purchase price of the materials that go into making it, but also the cost of everything else that goes into producing the product. So we can therefore say then that the cost is the sum of the material costs and of the expenses. And the reason that it's important to get costing right is because accurately recording the cost of an item plays a really key role in the decision making process. For example, how can the pie shop determine how much they need to sell a pie for if they don't have an accurate figure for the cost of producing it. Okay, so you can see there's a lot more to cost than you may have initially thought. And we've seen in this example how useful to a business costing is and how a business might choose to group their costs. But we're going to move on to explore the grouping of costs further by looking at cost centers, cost classification and cost elements before moving on to understand the different types of cost behavior. Now these are all fairly simple concepts but they form the basis of theory which is commonly examined and it's going to come up time and time again both in this syllabus and throughout your SEMA studies. So a good understanding early on is really important. And then armed with all of that knowledge we'll move on to looking at the different methods of predicting costs. So we've got the line of best fit method, the high-low method, and we've got linear regression. So as well as understanding the theory and how they work, we'll go through how to apply each of these methods to a real-world example, like you'll be asked to do in your exam, and we'll explore when each of these approaches is appropriate and the benefits and the drawbacks of each. Okay, so that's a lot to cover. Let's jump straight in and look at cost centres. And a cost centre as you can see by the definition, is effectively a grouping of costs which relate to specific activities or functions. So let's return to the example of our local pie shop. Now, the boss decides she wants to get a better understanding of the costs that are being incurred in different areas of the business. So what areas might she want to associate costs to? Well, she might decide she wants to group together all of those costs that are associated with the kitchen where the pies are made and also grouping together all of the costs associated with the shop where the pies are sold. So why might she want to group costs in this way? Well, essentially, this is the structure of a business. It's got two main parts and so it makes sense in this case. But for bigger operations, for bigger organisations, there may be tens or hundreds of cost centres that they want to divide and group their costs into. 
But the boss might also have another reason for doing this. Let's say, for example, that she is fully aware that the production manager who runs the kitchen has a bit of a reputation for not keeping an eye on what she's spending. By grouping costs in this way, the boss can identify what's being spent by the production manager and separate this from the amount being spent by the shop manager. And by doing so, she'll be able to help managers understand their costs better and it enables budgets to be set for each areas of the business. So this helps in making comparisons and also helps in controlling costs. It's a good form of internal control. So we can see from this example how cost centers can be a useful tool for a business. And there are different types of cost center you'll be expected to be aware of in your exam. Now, we've seen that the pie shop has costs directly related to each pie, the cost of the ingredients, for example, as well as the cost associated with the production of each pie. But it's also possible to differentiate between costs based on four key areas by function, by activity, by service location and by equipment. So a function cost center then refers to an entire department or a role within a business. So for the local pie shop, the production department would be one cost center where all of the costs associated with creating the product, for instance, the making and the baking of the pies would be included. Now, an activity cost center is where costs are associated with a specific activity are grouped together. So taking the production department, rather than having a whole lump of costs, the pie shop might want to break this down into the individual activities. So the making of the pies would be one cost center and the baking of the pies would be another, for instance. So it's this specific activity that's determining the costs that are being included. Now, a service location cost center is very much, as the name suggests, is a classifying of costs based on a particular location. So the cost center is essentially defined by where it's based. Now, we've been talking about one independent pie shop, but let's take, for example, a chain company, a large operation like Nike or Walmart, for example. They have stores all over the country. Now, they might want to look at costs on a store by store level, they might want to look at all of the costs for their stores in one particular city or maybe even one particular country. It's the location that's determining which costs are being included in that cost centre. So that's three out of the four. And the last one is the equipment cost centre. And I'm sure you can guess it consists of all the costs associated with the purchasing and the running of a particular piece of equipment or machinery. So let's say, for example, the pie shop has a machine that puts the filling in all of their pies. What costs are related to this machine? Well, there's the price the business paid for it. There's the cost of insuring the machine, the cost of servicing and maintaining it. So all of the acquisition and running costs of this piece of equipment would be collected under the pie filling machine cost center in this example. OK. Great, so we can now see how and why it's useful to group costs together based on common characteristics in order to form a cost centre. But we can see that in these examples, there are a large number of costs that might be collected in one single cost centre. And before we do that, we might want to look at a system for collecting and sorting costs on a smaller scale. And this is where we move on to look at cost classification and cost elements. So usually we classify costs based on a number of different means and the purpose of doing this is to make sure that effective analysis can be carried out. So this means that good decision making can take place. So for example budgets can be set effectively, the prices of products can be set effectively, production volumes can be determined. Now one of the ways in which costs can be classified is by their nature and we've come across all of these types of costs already in this video without you even really knowing it but it's so important so we'll run through it again quickly so we've got material costs so these are all of the materials that go into the product that's being made so for the pie we talked about the cost of the eggs the milk the flour and the other ingredients now we also talked about how a pie doesn't just make itself so we need to pay for the labor so what costs would be associated with labor? 
Well, obviously we've got the cost of the wages, but it's also all the other employment related costs like pension plans, for example, these would all come under the heading of labour costs. And you'll remember we also talked about paying for electricity to run the machinery and rent on the shop and the factory. And these are classified as expenses. So basically all of those external overhead costs are not directly linked to making the product. So that's classifying costs by nature. But as I said at the beginning, there's more than one way to classify costs. And another is by purpose. And the key here is to determine whether or not the cost is directly related to the product. So, so far we've been using a really simple example of a pie shop. But companies can be much bigger and much more complex. And to illustrate classifying costs by purpose and function, it's a good idea to look at a more complex operation. And so let's take, for example, a car manufacturing company. So obviously they're going to have the cost of the materials, the labour and the expenses used directly in the production of the car. And so these are direct costs. Now, when thinking about direct costs, it's useful to think about the production line in the car factory. So there's the steel and the rubber, for example, used to make the cars. They're direct material costs. They're the workers on the production line building the cars and their wages and their pensions are direct labour costs, for example. And let's say that the car is being built to a specific design that's designed by an external company and the car manufacturer needs to pay a fee every time they produce a car using this design. That would be a direct expense. So we can see all of these costs then are directly related to the product being produced. They can all be attributed to an individual car. But we've also talked about how businesses incur costs that aren't directly linked to production. And in this case, we call these our indirect costs or our non-production costs. They can't be directly attributed to individual units being produced, but they're nevertheless necessary for the business to run. So again, thinking about our car manufacturer, they're going to have to buy the oil and the grease to use in the maintenance and upkeep of the machines. They're going to have to pay the salaries of the admin staff and all of the office workers, which are indirect labour costs. And then there's the rent on the factories and the offices, as well as electricity and heating bills, which are all indirect expenses. So as you can see, none of these costs can be specifically attributed to an individual completed car, but they're all necessary for the business to run. So now we know the different cost classifications, it can be useful to group these together to form the elements of cost, which is just the term we use to describe the total cost for the group. So for example, all of those direct costs can be grouped together into a figure that we call the total direct cost or the prime costs. And we do exactly the same with those indirect costs. They're grouped together to form a figure that we call the production overhead. And we can then add this production overhead figure to our prime cost, which gives us our production cost, which we also call the factory cost. Okay, so let's see how all of this works and with some figures. Let's say our car factory also produces a model toy version of their best selling car. And it's got the following direct cost. So we can sum these together to give us the figure we know as the, that's right, it's the prime cost. So in this case, it's simply £20. And we can do exactly the same. We can sum together those indirect costs. And the term for the sum of these costs we know is the overhead cost, which in this case is £20. And then the final step is to add together the prime cost and the production overhead figure. And the term for this, I'm sure you remember, is the factory cost, which for our model toy car comes to £40. Okay, so far so good. But I'm sure you're thinking, can it really be that simple? Is it really just a case of adding up a few expenses and we accurately find out how much something costs? Well... Let's consider two models of car produced in the factory. First up, we've got car A, and it's made from parts which cost the company £200, and it's got a selling price of £3,000. 
And the other imaginatively named model that the company produce is Car B, which is made up of parts costing £2,000, but still only has a selling price of £3,000. Now, considering only this information, car A is far more profitable than car B, right? So, if that's what the company thought, if they only had this information, they might consider specialising in producing car A, and they might even consider scrapping the production of car B altogether. But, what if the company found out that car A took substantially longer to build? Let's say five days in comparison to car B, which might only take an hour. What if car A could only be built by specialist engineers? What if it requires specialist machinery and the company needs to potentially move production to a bigger factory, especially for the building of car A? In light of this new information, what is the real cost of car A and car B? Are they both really still profitable? Well, this is the type of problem that businesses are faced with on a day-to-day basis, and it highlights the key point that costing is not always a simple exercise. But accurately costing products is hugely important because if you don't know the cost of your product, there's no way to know whether you're covering your costs and selling it at a profit. So to overcome this problem, then, businesses use costing systems. And costing systems are covered more in other areas of the syllabus, but essentially they take costs and accurately allocate them to outputs. So this means that a business can calculate the actual cost of producing each product and it can give them a better indication of each unit's profitability, which can help in things like pricing decisions and production volume decisions. Okay, So let's just take a second then and recap what we've covered so far. So we've used the pie shop to understand the different cost centers in a business and the different ways that we can classify costs. And then we've moved on to look at a bigger company, a company manufacturing cars, which helped us to understand the classification of cost by purpose, by function and by element. 